Okay, let's get into it. Um, thought I'd put this together. And I uh, thought we can look through this stuff together. I can show you where I find this information and sort of uh, talk about what I find and how I think they work, etc. Uh, so, okay. Um, I think the first thing we should start with is how vaccines work. And a vaccine essentially is meant to get your body to fight against a particular pathogen, virus, bacteria, etc. Right? Uh, and so I think just to be clear, right, like these are extremely common. I think you would be very hard pressed to find anyone living today who has not been vaccinated. Right. So it's it's almost I, you know, there must be some numbers there, at least in America. Right. You you will be hard pressed to find anyone who has never been vaccinated. Um, and so it's almost the uh, it is the norm. It is not normal to not be vaccinated. Right. Um, and vaccines save lives. Uh, it is an amazing sort of technology and breakthrough. And really, it's just leveraging what the human body does uh, normally. So just to put some context, right? So when you are infected by a virus or a bacteria, especially if it's something your body has not seen before, uh, you get infected and your body wants to fight off this intruder. And... Um, and your body does so. But if that infection is a very bad infection or if it's to an end, what, what is an infection, right? It's this virus or bacteria that gets in your body and hangs out in a certain place, but then it starts to grow. And, you know, it's one thing to kill a few viral particles or a few bacteria, but it's a whole nother thing to, uh, once it starts replicating your body, it's this big thing it's trying to fight. So your body, most people successfully fight these bacteria and virus, and we're constantly being invaded with bacteria and virus. You, you have more bacteria in your body, bacterial cells in your body than human cells. That's kind of hard to believe, but th let me just repeat it. You have more bacterial cells in your body than human cells. Uh, you know, some, some people say you're just, you know, you, you're, you're, you're just hanging out, the, the, the bacteria is just using us to hang out. But anyway, so, okay. So the way a vaccine works or an infection works is based on the immune system. The immune system is your body's uh, basically unit of dealing with intruders and invaders like viruses and bacteria. And so when you get infected, your uh, immune system sees this and it essentially attacks either the virus or the bacteria or it attacks the cell that that virus has invaded and kills it so that it won't uh, continue replicating. Uh, and so essentially what a vaccine is, is kind of like a controlled infection. Okay, it's like instead of just having you randomly breathe in some flu or some coronavirus from somebody who's like carrying a heavy load and they sneeze and boom, you get hit with, you know, a million viral particles or something like that. I'm just throwing out numbers. But instead of something like that, it is a controlled dose of a pathogen. And so it's like giving you just a tiny bit of it to tickle your immune system such that it'll ramp up a response, but without the potential problems that can come up with a real infection because with a real infection it can get out of control um, and so by giving it in a controlled manner you can minimize sort of the potential dangers like you know people die from these things and the vaccine is meant to save so so just let's look at the types of vaccines and there's many different ways of doing it and it really started with the first wave of live attenuated vaccines okay live attenuated vaccines basically that means that it's 
in this case, and these are the types that are live attenuated, measles, mumps, or the MMR vaccine, rotavirus, smallpox, chickenpox, yellow fever, right? Live attenuated means it's essentially, it is the virus or it is the bacteria and they attenuate it, meaning they kind of just weaken it a bit. Um, and there's different ways of doing that. They can produce like a, a virus or a bacteria that just is weaker, doesn't grow as fast or something like that. And we have to get into the specifics of each one in order to figure out how they did it. And that's, that's all public information. You can all look that up. Um, but I, I really don't know how they attenuated these. But it's essentially, it's just giving you the exact bug in this case, but just limiting the dose and dosing you with just amount, putting it in a very specific place such that you'll form an immune response against it. And so, and your immune system, it has a memory. So the next time you see or get infected with this uh, virus or bacteria, you will have an army waiting to fight it. They're already prepared and they're waiting to go to prevent this thing from causing problems. Um, so that is kind of the key point. So the first sort of types of vaccines were just basically taking the exact thing that causes the disease and just making it a little weaker and then injecting it. Smallpox like is a good example. Then you have some vaccines that are use inactivated uh, or inactivated vaccines. Basically these are the bug or the virus but they are inactivated such that they cannot grow again. It's essentially like you can take a virus and heat it up or destroy it in such a way, but it is the virus, but then you destroy it and deliver that to the person so that your body will see the shape and the, uh, basically they'll see what this bug looks like kind of, or the pieces of the bug, um, but it doesn't come with the risk of the, this virus replicating and growing and you know getting out of control upon vaccination these come with a risk that hey this thing might actually start growing and you know mimic a very small infection in a human and if you have a you know compromised immune system this these these can grow and get out of control the vaccine i'm saying um, the live attenuated it's not meant to be the case and they test these things for that purpose but that's sort of like first generation right then the inactivated vaccines, so they basically get it, stopping these things from being able to replicate and grow inside your body, the vaccine. Then you have these, the subunit types. Basically, what this is, is instead of infecting you with the whole virus, take one piece of the virus, the stuff that's on the outside of the virus, which usually what your immune system would see first, especially for antibodies, they bind to the outside, they don't get inside. And so just take that piece of the uh, bug and inject you with that piece of the virus. So it's not even an entire virus of, or bacteria, it's just a piece, and you form an immune response against that piece. And so, you know, for, and that can be very effective, especially for viruses, but bacteria as well, but viruses particularly because viruses have to get inside your cells to replicate. And so if you form an immune response to a protein that's on the outside of a virus and you develop antibodies, then antibodies are essentially like basically gum and they stick to those proteins and so you essentially cover up the outside of the virus and it stops the virus from getting inside your cells. If you stop the virus from getting inside your cells, it can't replicate, can't grow, and it's awesome. But if for whatever reason, like the flu or something like that, the virus decides it wants to change its clothes, you know, like uh, um, change up what that protein looks like on the surface, uh, then the antibodies won't bind against it. It's like a new type of virus, but it's the same virus, but it's wearing slightly different clothes, if that metaphor comes across. But uh, then these toxoid vaccines, uh, what is this? Okay, targeted to a toxin, etc. But then you have, like the, the generation now, you have DNA vaccines or mRNA vaccines, like the coronaviruses. So, I had one here. What are the different coronavirus COVID-19 uh, vaccines? 
And so the two that are authorized and recommended, this is the CDC's website, are the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine and Moderna's vaccine. Both of these vaccines are mRNA vaccines. Very different from the stuff we talked about here, but I'll tell you how this related. And next up is AstraZeneca's vaccine, which is a DNA vaccine. Um, and these other ones are, I think, further behind. I, don't, I, I haven't looked into those. Um, so these three have been published, Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca is almost maybe close to being approved, but I'm not sure. So then I thought we would just go through those publications and let's just look at it with an objective lens and just see what, what did they do and how do you test something like this. I'm probably going to walk you through a thought experiment before doing this, but uh, we'll get into that. Um, Johnson & Johnson, yeah, that's a DNA. I, you know, this one's pretty cool, but we'll go through that too. Here's something I, I found. This is from Science Magazine. Science Magazine is basically the most premier journal of scientists. Um, basically, um, the most cutting edge research, the best work over the world gets pu published in this journal. It's very hard to publish in this journal. Um, but one infographic that they produced here is uh, a graph, a timeline of cases for diseases and how those cases changed upon the vaccine being approved. This is just cases in the United States uh, and the link, you can see it. So let's just look at it. So they got different diseases, diphtheria, polio, pertussis, measles, Hep B, chicken pox, and chicken pox, we're probably all familiar with. Hep A, mumps, rubella. So what's cool here, they got a timeline, and it's an infographic, so you can hover over it. So diphtheria, 1945, 18,000 reported cases. 1946, 16,000, so it went down a little bit. Vaccine um, put in place in 47, and you can see the cases just drop. I mean, it, it works. Polio, you know, polio is a disaster. 28,057, 38, vaccine, boom, 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 boom. 61, 1,000 cases. I mean, here, there's still a few little hundred cases in the 60s compared to 50. I mean, you see the effectiveness. Pertussis, same thing, the effectiveness. Hep B, chicken pox is the amazing one, right? Uh, because it's something we probably all had. And uh, the vaccine was only approved in 95. So probably we, I, you know, none of us were probably vaccinated. But maybe your kids got vaccinated. Uh, probably, I hope you saved them from that uh, disaster of what chicken pox was. And you can see the cases staying pretty consistent, like 200,000 every year in the U.S. Vaccine gets put in place and it drops. A little bit of a bump here. I wonder if these are people who just decided they weren't going to vaccinate the kids or whatever. But, you know, you can see the effectiveness. Hep A, mumps, rubella, same story. And if you were to look at the deaths, you would see a very striking picture similar to this. The numbers would be a lot lower. Uh, and, and, you know, people aren't really dying of chicken pox. You know, chicken, I mean, but at the same time, you know, for these other ones, it's, it's a really nasty thing. So anyway... Vaccines work extremely well. Uh, you'll be very hard pressed to find anyone who has not been vaccinated in the U.S. And, you know, it's not to say that there is no um, issues with vaccines in the sense that like, you know, vaccines do cause, and we're gonna look at what, what happens, the side effects of vaccines in these studies. Um, but, you know, you'd much rather have a fever than to die <laughs> or to have, you know, a, a lung problem where your lungs are messed up, you can't breathe. You'd much rather have the chills for a couple nights uh, rather than to be, you know, sleeping with an oxygen tank, you know. So, all right, let's get into, uh, well, let's look at this. This is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but it, it sort of proves a point of how um, these vaccines work, and it gives some visual sort of thing. So this is a diagram of coronavirus, and this is this thing called a spike protein. Basically, it coats the outside of the virus. A virus is simply a, a bubble with a 
you know, a gene in the, on the inside, or a genome, should I say. And on the outside, it's like, you know, a cell membrane with some proteins embedded, just like all our cell membrane. But this thing is tiny. It's a tiny little bubble. And one of the proteins on the surface is called the spike protein. And that one seems to be the most important and most robust. And that's what most of the vaccines are designed against, the spike protein. Uh, and so what Johnson & Johnson, which is the Janssen vaccine, uh, it's here, um, they made a DNA vaccine, which takes DNA and that DNA codes for the spike protein of the virus. So essentially, and, and this adenovirus is basically a tool. <laughs> yeah, it gets a little complicated, uh, but the adenovirus is essentially being used here as a tool. It is a different type of virus, which has just been made. The outside of the virus has been made, but the inside has not. Uh, so it's not like it can replicate. Uh, but this is made in order to deliver this DNA inside of cells. Um, and so that's essentially, and viruses are, that's, they, they must enter inside a cell in order to replicate. And so viruses are a very good tool, which we use in the lab to deliver stuff inside of cells. And there's other ways of doing it too, lipid nanoparticles you'll find from these other vaccines. Uh, so, but here they're using an adenovirus deliver the DNA into the cell. The DNA is just a code, which all our cells have some DNA and viruses have DNA. Some viruses just have RNA as well. But there's DNA, which then gets made into mRNA. And the mRNA is what leads to the production of protein. Essentially, this DNA vaccine tells your cell to produce the spike protein. Okay, let me just repeat that. This Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine is delivering DNA, and that DNA is a little piece of DNA that tells your cell to make the spike protein. The pro spike protein is the protein component on the surface of the coronavirus. Uh, and so what happens is you're some cell in your body or cells make this protein and then they show it on their surface and essentially your immune system can detect that and form an immune response against it and hopefully make some antibodies to it. Ah, this is what I was talking about, antibodies working like gum. Essentially the antibodies then are very specific against the protein. And essentially, if there's virus floating around, they can bind it and be like gum and stop the virus from infecting cells. Uh, and this is kind of talking about some other stuff. But anyway, that's uh, vaccines kind of 101. All right, the different vaccines, Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, both of those are mRNA vaccines, AstraZeneca, which I thought was a DNA vaccine as well. Let's just see. Uh, yeah, replication deficient chimpanzee adenoviral vector contained in the structure. <laughs> yeah, they make this very easy to read. Essentially, it is, it seems just like the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Let me make sure this is AstraZeneca. Yeah, this is AstraZeneca. Yeah, it seems very much like this one. It's an adenovirus carrying DNA to the uh, spike protein. But first we'll start with the uh, Pfizer BioNTech one. So how do you know, let's just do a thought exercise. How do you know if a vaccine will work? You know, if you, if you think through it, I'm telling you, It'll, it'll make you, you'll see the challenge. You know, it is a very tough thing to do, especially for a disease that is urgent, like coronavirus, and severe. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a tough one. Not just making it, but like, how do you prove that this thing actually works? 
you know, of course they did all the animal testing. Of course they did this stuff. And I'm not, di I'm not going through that here. But, you know, sure, you can show something that works in an animal. Because in an animal, you can actually challenge them with, you can say, okay, if this vaccine works, it will prevent a human or an animal from getting coronavirus, right? You ch and so how do you prove it? You actually infect them with coronavirus and then you see if they get sick. You see what I'm saying? You can't really do that with human beings, right? You can't say, uh, you know, this is a, uh, it's an investigational drug, you know, we think it's going to work, it worked well in animals, and so if it works, we will just, you know, we're going to see if it works by just injecting you with some virus and seeing if you actually get sick. Like, no, you can't do that with humans, right? So that makes it very challenging. Challenging, you know, I'm saying it's challenging, but it's like, what's the alternative? You can't, you can't just go and start... Uh, testing to see if it works in human by actually infecting them. So what do they do? And that's where the beauty of it, but also you can see the scale and just how big this is, right? So what do they do? They took, and this is just, let's see what this covers. Okay, this is an ongoing, multinational, placebo control, this is the key, observer-blinded, pivotal efficacy trial. <laughs> Sign person 16 years of age or older in a one to one ratio. They get two doses, 21 days apart. So you get dose, 21 days later, you get the second dose. And that happens either with a placebo or the vaccine candidate. Okay. Uh, and so let's just talk about what is this vaccine? It's a lipid nanoparticle formula. Yeah, I didn't talk about what's the MR, what's mRNA vaccine. I, I guess it's it sort of touched on here. Uh, yeah, let's talk about that before we get into the paper. So what is an mRNA vaccine? So the DNA vaccines I mentioned, it's basically a code, the DNA, to make the viral spike protein. And this is how our cells in our body work. We have DNA, you have DNA in all your cells, and that DNA is the code to produce all the proteins and components of your body. <laughs> and so the DNA is the same between your nerve cells in your brain and your, you know, liver cells and your bone cells, even though they are very different. They all have the same set of instructions. But those instructions, it's, it's huge, by the way, right? It's 46 chromosomes, right? Like, uh, it, it, I, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, 46. Am I, do I got that right? Let me just check. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 23 pairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This shows you the image, right? So we can actually stay in chromosomes because um, then you got the X and Y or, or two X's, right? Okay, so. And those instructions are in every cell. It's the DNA. And every time a cell replicates, it makes a copy of that DNA and uh, passes it on to the next cell. Now, <clears throat> what makes a bone cell different from a brain cell, different from a liver cell? Well, the cells don't turn, the, again, the DNA is just a set of instructions that set of instructions is not being used all the time. Like if you have instructions to build a house, the plumber, he's not gonna be messing with the electricity or you know, maybe if you got a guy who's doing it all, right? But you know, there's a specific way to deal with the plumbing, specific way to deal with the electricity, it's all to build a house, right? Same thing with the cells. Bone cells will, what we say, express different genes than liver cells. And the way that sort of works in a very simplified way is that DNA is just instructions, but it doesn't actually make anything unless it's expressed. Genes get expressed, meaning the DNA, the expression basically gets, DNA becomes mRNA. They, the, the cell makes it into mRNA. And then mRNA is what gets translated into protein. Proteins are what basically do all the work 
in your body. Um, and the instructions on what proteins to make come from DNA. But the, the way it goes, DNA, RNA, or mRNA, and then protein. Okay, DNA doesn't make protein directly. It needs to make, DNA gets copied into mRNA. mRNA then makes protein, it's translated. Okay, that's how it works. So, I, you can kind of see, may, I don't know if you can see where this is going. First generations of vaccines, the live attain, basically took the bug itself and basically injected you with a small amount of it or a live attenuated one. Or you take the bug and you kill it somehow, then you inject it. Now, what the sort of improvements in the way vaccines have been developed is instead of trying to make the bug itself and deliver it, like you gotta, you know, just imagine if you have to make a virus or make, I mean, yeah, you probably don't never thought about this stuff, but it's you have to grow this stuff right and then it's extremely infectious right like if that thing spills or something you know you're you got a big problem um and you know so what the next gen dna vaccines instead of giving you a piece of the virus or giving you the virus itself they give you the dna for the virus so that you have the instructions to make the protein itself because otherwise what manufacturing drug development people have to do they would have to make that virus or make the protein it depends on the type of virus we, we talked about that uh vaccine types right so like to make measles in a lab make a ton of it right and then do something to attenuate it you know like that's a big involved process it's, it doesn't mean that it's easy to make dna but protein is uh is it's it's much there's a lot of things that have to happen right i mean there's a lot of things in every case but so dna is essentially instead of having to deliver the protein you deliver the dna the other thing about protein it needs to be folded a certain way like i don't know it just presents some challenges uh dna makes the instruction then your cell makes it in the proper way so you don't have to worry about you know the protein being something went wrong with it or you know like there's a lot of caveats there all right i'm babbling here now mrna vaccines are basically taking it a step further dna in order for it to make the protein has to not only get inside the cell it's got to get inside the nucleus which is essentially another obstacle in the way <laughs> Whereas mRNA vaccines, they don't have to get into the nucleus. The translation happens in the cytoplasm. So mRNA is essentially just a set of instructions. But in your cells, mRNA is like, a, mm, let's say, a short-term delivery instructions, basically. You know, it's like uh, it's the it's the 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 work that's happening today essentially it's not the whole plan for you know the life of the cell it's just what needs to happen like right now you know temporary instructions essentially so the mrna gets translated and eventually it gets degraded and goes away so it's like short term so it's it's bypassing a lot of steps and that's what makes it faster <laughs> There's a lot of things that had to go in to get mRNA to work. <clears throat> There's a lot of challenges. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but no time to get into all that right now. Uh, but it is a true breakthrough. Uh, and that is in large part why they're able to do it so fast. It's because you don't have to make a protein. Um, and the protein doesn't, you don't have to make sure it folds correctly. You don't have to grow up tons of virus or bacteria in the lab somewhere. You just need the instructions. And then your cell will make it the correct way. So instead of manufacturing the protein in some huge vat plant somewhere, uh, you just get the instruction. Now you still have to make this, uh, but uh, you know this is much easier and faster to do than having to do the protein work. <clears throat> okay, now we get into the studies. Sorry, that's like, what I don't know, 30 minutes or so. All right, let's get into it. So, Pfizer vaccine. It's ongoing. It's just 
all right, when is this published, by the way? December 31st, 2020, right? So two months ago. Um, and we talked about how one would go about evaluating a vaccine. What do you need? What would you think to do? You would think the only way you know if this thing actually works is to challenge people with the virus. But of course, we can't do that with humans. So how do, how do we do this? Essentially, what they do is they give people the vaccine and they give another set of people placebo, which is basically not the vaccine. It's not supposed to do anything. It's basically like a saline solution. Um, and this, we talked about this um, vaccine. It's a lipid nanoparticle. Basically, this is the bubble mimicking like a virus. This is to get it inside the cell. Uh, lipid nanoparticle. It's basically, you know, think of it like a, a bubble. We'll, we'll look at this too. Um, nucleoside modified RNA vaccine. Nucleoside modified. Basically, they had to make changes. They couldn't just get use regular RNA like our cell uses. And there's many, many reasons why they couldn't do that. But this is actually part of the secret sauce to making this work because it wouldn't work uh, just the normal RNA. Uh, that encodes a pre-fusion stabilized membrane anchored SARS CoV. Huh? Pre-fusion stabilized. That's probably that's a key word too. It's about how the the spike protein works and the shape of it uh, when it's infecting a cell or not. Membrane anchored full length spike protein. So it's just mRNA that tells the cell to make this spike protein the spike protein is the component of the virus on the outside okay um now <laughs> how do they do this Forty-three thousand people okay and this is ongoing right and this is the phase three trial um 43 000 people included here but they randomized them one to one so 21,000 got the vaccine 21,000 got the placebo. Uh, and they say there were eight cases with onset at least seven days after the second dose of money. Yeah, they, they put this in a certain way, but then they talk about the effectiveness. But let's let's just look at this uh, and let's see if I can zoom in a bit. Here we go. OK, so lipid nanoparticle, which has mRNA which makes the cell produce the spike protein, which then gets recognized by the immune system and you get an immune response to it. So, you, so you're not even putting in the instructions to make the entire uh, virus, right? So you, you cannot make the virus from the vaccine. You only make this one piece. It is the spike protein. You don't make the whole virus. That's just one sort of thing that people uh, really get mixed up. So greater than 16 years, greater than or equal to 16 years old were assigned to get the vaccine. It's an intramuscular injection, day zero, day 21. And then they follow them for a median of two months, but it's ongoing, so they're still following. So essentially what they do is, basically they immunize half the people and they give a placebo to the other half and then they have to wait and see who gets infected. And <laughs> it's, it's, it's something, you know? And that's why they have to do the clinical trial with such high numbers. Because if you think about the infection rates, you know, 43,000 people, the infection rate for coronavirus now, shucks, I, I don't even remember what it is, but it's, it's not. 10%, right? Like, uh, and then it's over a period of time, right? So, you know, this is, uh, so you have to have a lot of people in order to see some numbers. So we'll look at this. Let me just see uh, what else they have here. Yeah, I think the raw numbers first. Uh, no, this is just the enrollment. All right, well, let's just get back to this. So this graph is the key. So this is time. This is days after the first dose. And remember, you need to get two doses. Now, 
the, 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 the why two doses and some have one dose, it's about how, to, how you're turning on the immune system. And uh, I think there's probably some pros and cons to doing it one way or the other. You can imagine that, you know, if you tickle the immune system twice, you're, late, you're likely to get a better sort of memory to this burglar. You know, somebody come rob your house twice and they're doing it the same way. It's like sooner or later you're going to lock all the doors or something, right? Uh, but, you know, somebody rob you once and they really hit you hard, maybe then you'll prepare yourself, right? You're like never again. But, you know, maybe if they come in and just, you know, I don't know, do something small or something, then you're like, what is this? Maybe you don't take it as serious. And then you... anyway, I'm making some some examples here, but they're, they're really bad examples. But all right. This is the incidence of people who have symptomatic coronavirus. So basically who and the percentage of people that are getting infected on this time scale. So basically you monitor these people over time and this is the beauty of this. It shows just how great these back. So if you look, this is after the first dose. People are getting infected because coronavirus is like everywhere, right? So, but it's small. We're talking 0.2%. But uh, 1% of 21,000 is what is that? 210 people is 1%, right? Like, so the number of people we're talking about, it's in the hundreds, but it's small, but that's how many people you have to look at. So cumulative incidents, this is just the total number over time. So the more time you look, people are getting infected. You're not, you're not giving them the infection, right? They're naturally getting infected. So some of the people that participate in this clinical trial, they end up getting infected. But if you look at the group that was vaccinated, so this is after the first dose, one week, there's still some getting infected. But then getting close to two weeks after the first dose and it starts to really flatten out. On day 21, they get a second dose. And basically your immune system, and this is, this is trippy because we, we understand it so well, that it takes about two weeks for your immune system to really shape up. And that's, that is part of your, your adaptive immune response which is has the memory component it takes about two weeks uh, and so what you see is that those people who are immunized they basically they you know of those 21,000 people basically they're not getting the infection and if they are getting infected they have no symptoms whereas the people who got the placebo they're still at risk and they are getting infected. And they mentioned the exact numbers uh, somewhere. Let me zoom back out. Um, I think it's in this video I posted. But basically it was like eight people. Uh, let's just see if we can find it. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, no, let's see. Yeah. There were eight people who um, were positive uh, for, so eight cases of coronavirus in the vaccinated group. And this is at least seven days after the second dose when they looked up to the time shown here. You know, they went out, how, how far did they go out? This is up to 110 days or 112 days after the first dose. So, you know, they're still monitoring, but you can see just how effective this thing is. Um, eight there in again there's 21,000 people included whereas in those who got placebo at by that time 162 people uh, had cases so this is how you prove a vaccine is effective in this scenario because you can't just give them the virus so you have to just wait and see who gets infected and then you do some math and you say hey if I got 21,000 people in each group and I vaccinate one group, don't vaccinate the other. And in one group, you get this many cases. The other group, you get eight. This shows the vaccine is working. And then you get this effectiveness number, 95% effective. Because the reasoning is that if these folks were not vaccinated, they would have been at 162. Uh, so only 5% of this essentially was, you know, that's, that's how it's done. So 
Okay, the vaccine is working. It's very effective. How about side effects? That is key. Okay, <clears throat> now again, they're monitoring uh, side effects in both the placebo group and the vaccine group. And they look at local effects as well as systemic, basically stuff that happens across your whole body. Local is where they inject you. So, um, and they talk, the here is, is uh, looking at the doses. So let's just see what they say. Local and systemic reactions reported within seven days after the injection, according to age group. Um, and this is seven days after dose one or dose two. And then they do it at um, older folks or younger folks here, greater than 55 or, or 16 to 55. Um, so local, this is, uh, of course, at the injection site. And 83, this is percentage of people who had a local uh, effect here. Uh, and they mention what these, okay, here it is, is at the, at the bottom. Pain at the injection site, redness or swelling. So a lot more people felt pain at the injection site with the vaccine uh, than did the placebo. Uh, and that is expected because essentially you get this bug infection. Essentially, it's like an infection right there wherever they inject you. Then you get your immune cells come and see what the heck's going on. There's some, you know, your cells are crying out for help. Hey, I've been invaded. Something's attacking us. And your immune system sees it like a, it's like a real virus. And so, but it's a small dose, remember, and it's just how it's done. So you get this immune response. Um, and this is compared. So then what's trippy, you're like, okay, what about the placebo group? Why is there 14% of people who had some local? Because you're sticking a needle into them. So if you just break the skin, you'll get some immune response. So it's always good to compare to something. But this shows you that the, the vaccine is actually inducing much more than the placebo. This isn't the amount of pain, but rather it's the percentage of people who have pain at the injection site. Uh, redness, you know, a little bit more. We're talking, you know, 5% compared to 1% and swelling. But these local effects you would expect because it's just like if you cut yourself, you expect that thing to swell up or something around where, where you get the cut. Uh, now systemic events are more important. And um, this is percentage of participants again. So let's look at it. Um, fever, fatigue, which is just like you, you, you feel sluggish, headache, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, muscle pain, joint pain, and use of antipyretic medication. I think this would be like ibuprofen or acetaminophen. Um, and then they have it broken down, dose one, dose two, and uh, different ages. Uh, I think one thing that's interesting is that the pain, like fatigue, and the headache and the chills. Basically, they, a, more, a, a larger percentage of vaccinated folks feel these symptoms after the second dose versus the first dose. But anyway, if you look at the numbers, um, this is percentage of the total 21,000. So 4% of the vaccinated group got a fever after the first dose, 16% after the second dose zero percentage of people got a fever from the placebo group. Um, and so a fever is part of the immune response. So you expect some of it, uh, but 16%, you know, but this is what one could expect if they're vaccinated, that, you know, there is some likelihood that you may develop a fever and it's much more likely you'll get it at the second dose versus the first. Fatigue, you'll feel some fatigue, but then you see 33% of the placebo group felt fatigue, okay? So, you know, sure, if, if somebody just throws around a number and say, oh, 47% of people were fatigued after they got the vaccine, yeah, sure, but then if you just take regular old, you know, person, uh, you know, uh, and, and you just monitor them, some days they're not going to feel great, uh, you know, and that's just how it goes. That's why you need some comparison. So, you know, the difference is probably significant. I don't know, but it, this isn't a, a big difference. 
again with headache, right? You know, placebo group, 34% got headaches too, right? So it doesn't mean that the placebo is given a headache. It means that if you look at 21,000 people, some people get headaches on different days. And so, you know, here, 34% of people got a headache, even in the placebo group. Doesn't mean the placebo caused the headache. Uh, same thing with the vaccine. It doesn't mean the vaccine caused the headache, but this difference is suggested to be due to the vaccine because otherwise you don't have a control, right? So I hope that's clear. It doesn't mean the vaccine caused a ton of headaches or the placebo caused a ton of headaches. The difference between the two is what's thought to be contributed by the vaccine. Okay, chills vomiting, diarrhea, muscle pain, joint pain, etc. These are the percentage of people who experienced it in a time. And, uh, you know, that's this, this, this is what they got. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, you can look into that in, you know, however you want. Um, ah, this is the real numbers and number of cases and the time, etc. cetera, um, which is pretty cool. And it just the stats and talk about you know, what's the chances that this thing is efficacious? I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's working really, really well. Um, vaccine efficacy across age groups, which is pretty, I mean, you can see some, you know, it's very uh, um, few people greater than 75 that got infected among this placebo group. It tells you the percentages as well as the total number of people that were in the trial. Uh, Male or female, vaccine works. Usually vaccines don't work as well in older people. So this is encouraging. Um, now they break out the uh, races and ethnic groups. They tell you how many people. So 14,000 whites in this group, 1,500 black or African American, all others, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, you know, so they break it down a bit and African-Americans worked really well. The numbers are a little bit, because here, only seven African-Americans, of these 1,486 that were in the trial and received the placebo, at this time point that they checked, this is, um, what is it? Uh, time period of case accrual is from seven days after the second dose to the end of the surveillance period, which I think goes all the way out to 120 days. So only seven people got infected, uh, but none in the vaccine group. So it's 100% efficacious because n there was no one who got infected in the vaccine group. But you probably need more people and more time to evaluate uh, to get the real sort of number. Then you can see what it looks like. But overall, very encouraging. Um, what else they got? This is the graph we looked at, which, which I absolutely love. Um, talks about the number of participants, uh, you know, after the first dose, 50 people got in, even with the vaccine group, 50 people of, again, it's 21,000, uh, after dose one to before dose two, uh, 39 dose two to seven days after dose two. So within the seven days after the second dose, which will be somewhere like this, this week, two people, where it's 21 people here, and then greater than seven days after the second dose, that's from here on, you know, nine and 172, producing a 95% efficacy. Oops. So it works, and it works really well. Uh, and the severe adverse events, let's see, does this break it down? Um, this one sort of video, which was, maybe it's here. Let's just see. Supplementary material, protocol. Hmm. Oh, the original article. Ah, this one, which I posted on Facebook some time back. Uh, I don't know if you guys can hear B2 this, but they crunched the numbers on like the overall percentages and so forth. Um, 
And, you know, this is what you end up the with. The Se uh, Severe adverse events, 0.6% in the vaccinated group versus 0.5% in the placebo group. Um, so slightly higher, but overall relatively safe. Again, it's only in a limited time frame, but that's what you get. So let's see if they describe what are the uh, severe adverse events. Let's see, safety, local, systemic, adverse events. <clears throat> Ah, they give it in table S3. Let's see if we just pull it in uh, supplementary. Table S3. Um, severe. Now here, it's at, so any event, 26% versus 12% related, meaning C, let's see if they mention it. Assessed by the investigator as related to the vaccine. So basically they think these events were caused by the vaccine or like by the injection or something. So 20% versus five, severe and life-threatening. Okay, 21 cases had a life-threatening event, whereas 24 in the placebo had, because if you take any big group of people and you monitor them for some period of time, some people will have issues. Uh, it doesn't mean it's due to the virus, uh, and that's why you have a reference group, okay? Uh, severe adverse events, which I'm hoping they'll tell us what are the severe adverse events. Um, oh, any serious adverse event? This is just any adverse event, but this is serious adverse events severe adverse events, severe, serious adverse events, 0.3% versus 0.3%. So equivalent, life-threatening, equivalent. I mean, it's small, only 21 people here, 23 people here, um, 21 and 24 here. I don't know how they broke this up, but leading to withdrawal. Okay, let's see about that. 0.2, I mean, 37 people and 30. So do they outline what are these? severe adverse events oh underlying comorbidities i hadn't looked into this yet but I'm hoping they list that out <clears throat> uh, come on Uh, it, it really doesn't matter because there was really no difference between the two groups in terms of severe adverse events. We just looked at that, but I do want to, I, I bet, I wonder if these are considered, these are systemic events, but are they considered severe, ad, grade four, severe? Maybe it's due to the, uh, what's listed here, but what? What are those? I'm sure it's got to be here somewhere. But that's the Pfizer vaccine, mRNA vaccine, um, Pfizer BioNTech. All right, now let's look at the um, Moderna vaccine. Now, Moderna, just if you, yeah, Moderna is a relatively new company. Uh, I don't think they have any approved product other than this vaccine. They're a pretty novel, new, hot sort of company. Um, and, you know, their whole idea was to use mRNA as, a, as a, not just for vaccines, but for other things as well. Uh, I think this might be their first approved drug, um, whereas Pfizer, of course, has been around for forever. Um, okay, now let's just take a look at this. Uh, Randomized double blind trial, evaluate double blind trial, meaning double blind, that essentially means the person being injected doesn't know if they're getting the vaccine or the um, placebo. And the person doing the injection 
doesn't know if they're giving them vaccine or placebo. It's a double blind. Both people are blind. Um, and you only figure it out later on to so try to prevent any issues from popping up. In this one, so let's just see. I haven't read through this one uh, in detail, but again, lipid encapsulated mRNA vaccine encoding the spike protein. All right, it almost looks, you think it's almost the same exact thing. Uh, and they're probably extremely similar. Here, 30,000 participants. They did greater than or equal 18 years old. Um, and it's two intramuscular injections, 28 days apart. Um, so again, very similar sort of curve of infections like we saw before. Um, but the numbers here is 30,000. The other one was 40 some thousand, right? 21,000 per group. Here it's one to one. So 15,000, 15,000. Um, and look at this. I mean, it's pretty, I guess the arrows probably indicate the days on which they were vaccinated. So they get randomized, basically randomized, meaning they get assigned to be part of the vaccine group or the placebo group. Now, just think, I want you to think about it, you know, because by doing this placebo controlled trial, it's really, um, this is how to prove that the vaccine's working. But what does it mean? Like, if you're going in there, you think you're participating in this clinical trial, but there's a big chance, a 50% chance, you won't even get the real vaccine. So meaning you're still at risk of being infected. This is the issue with these vaccines, I, I guess, you know, in some way of looking at it, right? Um, because these folks in the placebo group are still at risk, right, of getting the disease. Um, and they get it. That's what this graph is showing. They get it. You keep looking over time and people are getting infected. Whereas in the vaccinated group, boom. I mean, only a slight upticks, you know, symptomatic COVID-19, up to this 11 versus 185. Look at the numbers. This is 11 out of 14,500, you know, whereas this is 108. So, you know, this is huge, you know, compared to, compared to this, right? 10 times will be 110. This is, you know, it's more than 10 times, right? That's, it's a 94% efficacy based on these numbers. And then severe COVID, 30, uh, whereas there was none here. So 30 out of 15,000, right? So that's, uh, so 30 out of 30,000, that is, what is that? 300 out of 30,000 is 1%. That's 0.1% uh, of 30,000. So 0.2%, uh, if I, if my math is right, 30 is 10, 100, one thought, yeah, I think I'm right. 0.2% uh, got severe out of the placebo. But, okay, all right, so it works. Let's look, see if they tell us about adverse events here. Very similar sort of thing. Any adverse event, and they list which ones, but the graph here, let's look at the graph. So local versus systemic. Injection site versus everywhere else. They have uh, the placebo, dose one, dose two, and the mRNA vaccine, dose one, dose two, and different grades of, and of course, the higher the grade, the red is uh, more severe. Uh, again, locally, pain, you know, a lot of people had pain at the injection site with the vaccine. You know, about 20% with the placebo, more like 85% with the vaccine. Erythema, basically like uh, redness, uh, you know, small amount, but you see it. Swelling, lymph adenopathy. Basically, the lymph nodes are like, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, they're like hubs for the immune system, and you have them all throughout. Here, they're probably looking at a lymph node that's near to the injection site, and probably it swells up a little bit, such that if you touch it, that part of their body, they feel a little bit of pain. Uh, systemic events, fever, headache, fatigue, myalgia, arthralgia, sort of like joint pain, muscle pain, nausea, vomiting, chills. Um, and, you know, fever, mostly after the second dose. Don't see it with the placebo. Headache, of course, 
even normal people who don't give them, you know, people get headaches for all kind of reasons. Uh, but you can see a little bit more. Uh, well, in this case, that's maybe what, 60% versus 25%. So almost two times as many people got a headache from the vaccine than the placebo. Fatigue, same sort of story. Muscle pain, joint pain. Um, and again, so a lot of these responses are expected. The extent of those, you know, how much of it's red and just how many people get it is another thing. But many of these responses are expected because you're trying to form an immune response. And that's, that's the thing to understand. Many of the symptoms and issues of an infection, many of them are due to your immune response to the infection. It's not necessarily the infection is causing the issues and causing you to feel bad, but usually it's your body trying to fight the infection which causes you to feel bad. <laughs> and it's done for many reasons that, that that happens. But So that's why you want to minimize the dose when you uh, give vaccines or an infection because too much of it and then you form a huge immune response and then sometimes that hum immune response can be over exaggerated and the immune response itself can lead to uh, many adverse events and even severe events um, so yeah but yeah look at these graphs I love these graphs man because it shows just it's it's amazing because if you know and I bet the math works out really well if you just monitor people over time people will get infected with the virus because that thing is rampant right now but the people who are vaccinated they are protected uh, and it's not a hundred percent right like some people are you know some people are still getting infected here it's not a hundred percent but it is damn near close uh, and it's it's a beautiful thing to see it you know um, and I only wish I could contribute to you know something so meaningful like this you know like how many lives have been saved by vaccines man just imagine if we still had to worry about smallpox man smallpox is a disaster why we don't have to worry about it vaccines you know polio man you know i i only wish i could uh do something that's so impactful um anyway then efficacy who is not um basically responding well to the vaccine. In this case, again, this is the Moderna vaccine. People greater than or equal to 65% had a lower efficacy than younger people. Again, I think I mentioned this before, vaccines usually don't work very well in older people. Um, I think the, 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 uh, this one was pretty close. Um, maybe here, yeah. 95, 93, 94%, 100%. Um, this looks good. Here, 86%, I mean, 86% is still pretty good. Uh, but this is, I guess, more in line with what I would expect. You don't expect older people to respond as well to vaccines just because their immune response isn't as robust. Um, male or female, white versus other communities of color. And it's interesting, the communities of color uh, seem to have a slightly higher this these differences are probably not very meaningful uh, and you can see these are error bars but we're talking you know 5,000 people in the placebo group 5,000 people in the vaccinated group versus 9,000 whites um, but they work and you know adverse events look like this okay this is the AstraZeneca one it's a different type of vaccine. Um, it's a DNA. Where, where does it mention it? Uh, we read. Where did, it, where did they mention this? Yeah, replication deficient, meaning uh, <laughs> it's a it's a vaccine a viral particle essentially it's an adenovirus vector that vector basically means it's just like the outside of the virus but it's the it's an adenovirus a different type of virus uh, but it's replication deficient it cannot replicate and make new virus particles and it contains 
uh, the structural surface glycoprotein antigen, the spike protein, the gene for this protein. So it's a DNA vaccine. Um, and let's see what we got here. I haven't read this, uh, but let's just look at it. How many people first? Let's look at that. Uh, so done in the UK and Brazil, anywhere else. Let's just go back to the beginning. Trying to speed this up, but take some time if you really want to understand these things. And they talk about when they looked, which is always good. This is in the Lancet. So New England Journal of Medicine is the other one's NEJM. Uh, which is uh, a much higher tier journal than the Lancet. Uh, probably because these were first, whereas this came uh, a little bit later. Um, okay, so UK, Brazil, and South Africa. Um, and does it mention how many people? All right, well, here we go. Between April and November, 23,000 participants were enrolled and 11,000 were included in the primary efficacy analysis. Okay, so they're only looking at 11,000 people for efficacy. In participants who received two standard doses, vaccine efficacy was 62.1%. Hmm. And in participants who received a low dose followed by a standard dose, efficacy was 90%, um, which is interesting. Overall vaccine efficacy across gross booth was 70%. From 21 days after the first dose, there were 10 cases hospitalized for COVID-19, and all of them were in the control group, meaning the placebo group. So um, 10 cases, people who got COVID and had to go to the hospital. Um, and so again, this is, we're talking 11,000 people they're looking at. Uh, but this is how you determine if a vaccine works. You have to do this type of work. Two were classified as severe, including one death. There were 74,000 person months of safety follow-up. So this is months uh, and people. 175 severe adverse events occurred in 168 participants. 84 in the vaccine group, 91 in the control group. So severe adverse events pretty much equivalent across the two groups. Um, three events were classified as possibly related to a vaccine. Um, okay, now let's see if they have some nice graphs that we can look at. This is people who were included. Um, I guess this one is a little bit tricky because it's done at different places and it's also comparing against this uh, I think they mention it. Let's just see. Yeah, so the control here is either a meningococcal group A vaccine or saline. <laughs> that makes it a little more tricky to interpret. Um, so this is just a standard, you know, meningococcal vaccine or saline. Uh, so maybe let's see if the graphs break down the two. Um, yeah, we'll have to see. Okay. Yeah, I guess, you know, having the control group as being a group that was actually vaccinated makes it really challenging to compare. I guess it's, you know, uh, I guess you wouldn't expect one vaccine to produce severe adverse events more than another vaccine, unless something's wrong with the vaccine, right? Uh, something's obviously wrong. Um, so, all right, let's see what we got. Okay, very similar sort of graph. This is the percentage, cumulative proportion, basically a percentage of people over time. Number of days since the second dose. I kind of like this because you don't expect any immunity to happen until after the second dose, well, optimal immunity. And here they excluded the first probably two weeks because again, the immune response really doesn't work extremely well until two weeks after the vaccination. So that's why this is excluded. So then you look at the events. Um, people who got the meningococcal vaccine, 
um, but not the coronavirus vaccine. They got infected over time with coronavirus, whereas the infection rate in the vaccinated group was much lower. Uh, again, they said it's like 70 percent um, effective. And they show you the actual numbers of people here, uh, which is cool. Subgroup comparisons that some people, some groups of people, did they respond better than others? Not going to get into that. Who received only standard doses? Yeah, they're digging into the dose thing about whether or not they got a low dose first versus the, the which I think is not important for this conversation. Uh, hospitalization. Okay, okay. Yeah, I guess that's all they got. I mean, you can always read this stuff. Um, but um, maybe they mention it. Yeah, I mean, the let's just go back and just sort of recap. Uh, severe adverse events. Efficacy. Yeah, this many. Safety follow-up. Median. So... If you look at all the people who were included, how long did they follow them for safety? Median means if, you know, they follow people for different times because, of course, they're not injecting 11,000 people on the same day. People come in on a rolling basis. So, but, and so they have to take a snapshot of the study in the middle. So median means the middle. So if you look at all the people, uh, half of the people were followed for at least three to four months, whereas the other half were followed for maybe, you know, there's some people follow, 50% ah, of the people were followed for, wait, no, 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 it, it doesn't mean that. Basically, it means that, um, yeah, at least 50% of the people will follow for at least three to four months. Many people will follow longer and many people will follow uh, for a lower amount of time, but the median is three to four months. The middle number, if you look at the time that all the people were followed, the middle number of all the people is three to four months. <laughs> oh boy, that's confusing, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, severe adverse events in 168 participants, 84 in the vaccinated group, 91 in the control group. So no difference in severe adverse events. Yet, they are 70% effective in the uh, not getting the coronavirus um, in that time period. So, okay, that sort of breaks it down a bit. It goes into the detail. There's a ton. All this stuff is free, by the way. Um, like you can check these. This is all published information, not behind a paywall. You don't have to pay to get this. Um, and what's cool, they have um, like that. Uh, yeah, there it is. So there's also a video for the Moderna vaccine from New England Journal of Medicine, uh, as well as a video for the Pfizer vaccine, which is here. And it basically summarizes the high-level points uh, of the two, which I really like. Uh, I haven't seen one for the AstraZeneca vaccine. So that's vaccines. Now, how were they able to get this thing to us so fast? So one is people say, oh, they skipped some steps and all the testing, they didn't follow up. I want you to think, how long do you think they should follow up? You know, first of all, these things are still ongoing. Things still still happening. But how long do you think is long enough? Right. So we, we looked at the graph. Like if you look at the graph, you see as you wait, people are getting infected. You know, somebody died, like, right? Like, people are dying. As you wait, people, let's just go to my, my, my favorite site for looking up coronavirus is the Financial Times because I like the way uh, they put these things together. Uh, this is the average daily deaths across the world. Guess where we are right here as of Jan this, this week, the last week in January. Almost 14,000 people dying every day across the world this week. Okay? 14,000 people. Let's look at, and, and what's really cool is this. Because sometimes looking at death rates is kind of, 
challenging. Some some com- countries may say, oh, this person died, but maybe it wasn't from coronavirus. Maybe it was from something else. So here, they don't... What they do in this analysis, they don't care about what, why people die. They're just looking at the number of people that die versus other years. So time is on this scale, and then the deaths here. The red is this year, coronavirus year, or at least the past, you know, this past year. Uh, and how different this is this year compared to other years. And basically, if we look at the United States, 18% more people died than previous years. And you can see what those previous years look like, you know? Then if you look at specific cities, it's just crazy. Like, uh, but you go in and look like some countries, you know, 89% of people, more people died in Peru this year than in previous years. You know, Mexico, 53% more people died. Like, it's crazy. Um, and then if you click in here, you can actually see um, the deaths or cases, new, and this is normalized to 100,000. So if you just look at the raw numbers, uh, you can see this is daily, seven-day rolling average. So basically daily deaths from September. You know, let's go back to uh, March when this thing all started. Daily deaths, you see this huge ramp up, got up to 2,000 people were dying almost every day around this April, May time frame. But look where we are now. 3,000 people every day in the United States are dying. <laughs> you know, it's kind of crazy. Let's look at the cases. Well, and, and, well, let's do cumulative too, like the total number. This is cases, how many people are being infected every day. This is cumulative number of cases in the United States. What is that? They, do, does it show me? Almost 25, what is it? 26 million people infected. You know, how many people in the United States? I think it's, what is it? Uh, 300 million, almost 10% of people in the United States are infected. I think it's 300 something million. Uh, in the United States, you know, look at that. What's the total number of deaths? Let's see. Almost 452,000 deaths. It's it's thing is massive. So, so yeah. So how does one do this? You know, how long do you need to monitor for the safety of a vaccine? You know, um, it's a good question, you know, but not only that, I think there, there a lot of the questions come up that there are shortcuts taken in making it. We looked at these papers. We saw how many people were included in these clinical trials. And again, this is just the phase three clinical trials, you know, 40,000 people in the first one, 30,000 in the Moderna one. Um, how many in the uh, in this one? Let's see. It was a. Uh, 23,000, but they only reported on 11,000, probably because these things are happening right now with time, right? So they, and they talk about what time, snapshot they took. So we're talking all together. If we just take 11,000, 30,000, and 40,000, I mean, that's 80,000 people we're looking at, you know? It's a drop in the bucket, sure, compared to, you know, the world, uh, but 80,000 people, that's no small number, you know? And it's three different studies. Uh, and it's happening in different countries, different doctors, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, that's pretty extensive uh, testing, if you ask me. Um, now, why is it that Moderna and Pfizer was able to do this pretty fast, and even this AstraZeneca is pretty fast? And it goes back to how the vaccines are made and designed. It is much faster to take the code for how to make a virus protein and deliver that rather than delivering the virus protein itself. Because essentially you cut out a lot of steps in manufacturing. You still have to manufacture the um, DNA or the RNA, uh, but you don't have to manufacture the protein. You basically 
given the instructions to your cell to take over that part of the job. And it's a better way of doing it. It's better to have your cell make it than to make it in some factory. Why? Because the way the immune system sees this thing is essentially the virus replicates in your cell and makes more of itself. So it's, it's basically mimicking the natural process much better than delivering um, this protein. Because certain things can happen to proteins after it's made that cause it to not work well. You know, you think about insulin, which is a protein essentially that people inject, right? I mean, they had times where the insulin has to be kept refrigerated, right? It's very temperature sensitive. I think now they solve that sort of issue. Um, but proteins are folded and they're very complex sort of things. So it's cutting out a lot of steps. So it's that breakthrough in technology which really enabled this to happen. Not, and, and that's, that is the major contributor to the speed of this development. Um, the second thing is the funding financial backing you I want you, you know you think about it how much money does it cost to do something like this on this scale let's just think about this study in general you have to you know study 40,000 people give them injections of I mean I'm telling you it's massive and so imagine you making a vaccine you're not sure it's going to work for one. You don't know unless you test it. And then if it doesn't work, you've done all this effort and no one's going to buy it. No one's going to buy your drug or your vaccine unless it works. You know, if I make a pain medicine and I'm trying to sell you pain medicine, maybe you will buy it once. You'll never buy it again if it doesn't work. You know, I think people have to be clear, like a company like Pfizer been around for a long time, multi-billion dollar company. You know, their success is because they make drugs that work, good drugs. If a company doesn't make a drug that works, no one's going to use it, you know? I mean, if, you, if you're taking some drug and, and if you don't know the drug is working, then, I mean, either you just got to wait a little bit and find out, but, you know, why would you keep taking something that's not working? You know, it doesn't make any sense. So the long-term view here is to produce something of such quality that, it, you know, people want to take this thing, you know, and it works and save lives. Uh, so, you know, people always talk about, oh, is the money this and the money they're going to make, etc. You know, that's a big risk to make a vaccine. And then here's the other thing. You're competing with other companies. So people get vaccinated. It's only two shots. You're not going to get vaccinated again. It's very unlikely you'll get vaccinated again. So it's basically... If there are three approved drugs, one person is only going to take one of them, right? So, you know, if another company beats you to get the first vaccine out there and it works, why in the world would you, you know, you, if, you're, if you're the third place winner here or fourth or fifth place, you know, like there's a big risk. No one's going to buy your drug, you know, because they already have, they've already been vaccinated. <laughs> no one needs another vaccine. Um, so... You know, and I mean, then I, I know probably the thought could be my oh, so they, that's it. They're trying to go really fast. But again, there's certain steps and measures in place to make sure, um, you know, as best as possible that things are safe. And we looked at the trial on how it's done, how many people were included to make sure this thing was. These are, the, you know, these are test cases. This is a clinical trial. Forty thousand people. It's not 400 people. Right. It's not just a couple thousand people. You know, and they publish the data. Look how much they looked at. You know, it's, I don't know, it's a pretty, pretty awesome sort of thing. Uh, but again, the real key is that the breakthrough in the technology, mRNA vaccine, skipping a lot of steps. No need to make the protein, don't even need to make the DNA, and don't have to get into the nucleus, just mRNA. Uh, and then the funding. So because there's so much financial backing from the government and people have made certain commitments, so it basically de-risks the thing because the government's like, hey, we need something, right? So the government participates in funding some of this. I don't think they funded the Pfizer one because Pfizer is well sort of pocket, right? I mean, like Pfizer's uh, a big, big shot. But still, it'll hurt if uh, this thing didn't work and they, you know, this, this trial failed. And that happens. You know, you get to the clinical trial phase three and some things fail. Some things don't work. Um, but this seems to work. Um, 
And so because of the risk of just how large uh, a loss this could be, governments step up and they commit to paying for so much or buying so much of the drug or something like that. You know, I don't really know what the deals look like, but because, you know, it's, it's a very competitive space. Again, people only need one vaccine. So, you know, you got a bunch of companies making it because you're not sure which one's going to work, which one works better. Uh, the availability, all that's important. So, all right, I'm going to stop here. It's been like an hour. I'm supposed to be doing something else, but um, that's where we're at. Uh, I am happy to take any questions, dig deeper. You know, I'm not really working directly on this stuff right now. I'm an immunologist by training, but uh, if there's something not clear you want me to dig into, happy to dig into it. Uh, but I highly recommend people get vaccinated. Um, you should do it uh, because worst case scenario, you get severe coronavirus and maybe you get some lung damage. And again, we looked at the numbers, you know, people dying, you know, people are dying. Cumulative deaths in the United States, you know, what, 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 what was it? 450,000 people died. So, and this is, you know, all the different countries here. Um, so, all right, I'm gonna call it that. That's it. Stay safe. And, um, uh, yeah, feel free to reach out if you got any questions. Peace.